Hey, as you're passing the baskets, go ahead and grab your Bibles if you have them, or your phone, or your iPad, or have you access to scriptures. We're going to end up uh, eventually landing in Philippians chapter 3. We'll look at verses 1 through 17. So as, as John mentioned, we've obviously come through this month called Discipleship Essentials Month, which is taking one specific area of what it means to follow Jesus and discipleship and focusing on that. And this year it's been the Bible for this month. And so we've walked through and we've looked at what is the Bible and can I trust the Bible. And last week, if you were here, um, remember Megan spoke and she talked about how we approach the Bible and how that has more to do with the way we approach God and how that kind of becomes kind of the way we come to the scriptures with what God's doing in our life. And so this week we're going to talk about how do we apply the Bible to our lives. And so, so I, I'm going to ask you if, you're going to, if you would, kind of, we're going to take a journey together that's going to kind of start in a certain direction and then we're, we're going to end, end, eventually we'll get to where we're going to be, but it's going to take a little, little, be a little bit different this morning. So kind of put it in, the, in this, this kind of frame, framework. So if anyone flown on an airplane before, okay, so on a commercial airliner, normally you end up getting anywhere between 30 and 40,000 feet, so that's your cruising altitude. When you look out the window at that height, you can see things, but you can't see great detail. You can see a long way. You can see, uh, you know, especially if at night you can see lights in the distance, or if you're flying over the ocean, you can see the ocean. But it's not until you lower your altitude that you get, you get more detail. And so it's kind of like today, we're, we're going to start up at like 40,000 feet, and we're going to slowly descend, and then eventually we're going to land. And when we land, that's what we call applications. Finally, when we get down to the ground and you see the details, it's like I've flown to LAX so many times, I can't, can't count how many times. But if you've flown in, you know, if, you, if, you're, coming, if you're coming up over the ocean, you usually go to the east, and then you turn back to the west, you go past downtown, and then you know you're getting close. This is for me, because this is always a warm feeling, because they didn't have this when I was in Oregon which is in and out When you cl- cross Sepulveda Boulevard and you're landing on the north runway, if you're sitting on the right side of the plane, you see in and out and you're like, I'm home, right? <laughs> you actually see that. And then you can actually, it's so clear, you can see how long the line is when you get in your car if you get your first meal, right? So when you land, then you know, because you, you, you can make things out when you're at ground level. That's what application is. It's when you get down to the ground level and you can see the detail of what you've understood and now you can figure out how to live that out. Now, what we're going to do today is extremely important because... What we don't understand sometimes is that we, Megan talked about this last week, that when it comes to the scriptures, that, that what is required of us is sometimes more than we want to be required of us. And that is that if we can think, I just, if I just open it and I just read it, and many times when we just read it, you can get the understanding of what's there, but many times you're going to have to dig. You're going to have to remember that the Bible was not written to us, it was written for us. So it was written to a group of people thousands of years ago living in a different time, in a different culture, with different language, and different issues maybe that they were dealing with, but it's written for us to understand what that means for us today. And so we're going to talk about that. Why is that so important? Because if we don't take time to dig and to study and understand what's there, we can end up taking passages of Scripture. And when we get to the application part, because what has happened in this journey to get there is that we didn't understand the context or understand what was going on there. And what we came up with was, wasn't exactly what the intended meaning was for that verse. So let me just give it an easy example that happens all the time. There's a lot of like famous verses that people, even people are outside the church, they'll know these verses like John 3, 16. We know for God so loved the world that. But uh, another one that's probably more, even more in the church, but Philippians 4, 13, which is, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If you, you didn't know the, the, like the chapter and verse, but you've heard that verse before. And, and that verse is used for all kinds of stuff. I mean, I've heard that verse quoted for everything under the sun. When we look at a circumstance or we want something really bad, we, we quote that and we say, I can do it because Christ lives in me. I can do everything. I can be Superman. I can win the lottery. I can buy the biggest house. You can apply it to anything. Uh, Steph Curry, who plays for the Golden State Warriors, actually has 419 on his shoes because that's his life verse. In fact, he wanted to put those on his shoes when he had a contract with Nike, and they said no. And so he said, bye-bye, and he went to Under Armour, and they made millions. And Nike's like, whoops, we made a mistake. But it's everywhere. In fact, in high school, I remember my coach in one of like the end of the season, we were playing for the league championship and we were down by two with two seconds left and he calls a timeout and he brings us over to the huddle and he literally quotes Philippians 4.13, excuse me, 4.13, not 4.19, 4.13 and he quotes it like, you guys are gonna win because you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And I'm like, yeah, that's what that verse means. I knew Paul was thinking about basketball when he wrote it 2,000 years ago. But we ended up thinking that. And I remember when I got a little older and I started to actually study the Bible, I thought, that's not what he was talking about. 
In fact, what happens when we do that is that we think we are giving the verse more meaning when we're actually giving it less meaning. So let me explain. So we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more of this if in, in talking about the book of Philippians, but you have to understand what Paul was talking about. Paul's writing from prison. Paul's not writing from like the greatest moment of his life. He's actually writing from a place where he's incarcerated. He's writing to a group of people that he has a strong connection with because he helped plant the church in Philippi. And so he has this relationship with them, but he's also shared with them much of his suffering and his pain and his difficulty and his victories and his defeats in following Jesus. And so the key to verse 13 is actually verse 12, which says this. Paul says, I know how to be brought low, and how to, be, how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing p- uh, plenty and hungry, hunger, abundance and need. What is Paul talking about? In the greatest moments of my life, Jesus lives in, in me and I can do all things. At the lowest moment of my life, Jesus lives in me and I can do all things. What he's talking about, he's actually talking about contentment. The all things that Paul's talking about is I am connected to Jesus regardless of the outside circumstances, what I'm trying to achieve in life. Jesus is the constant, and because he's the constant, I can remain consistent and content in every situation that I go through because that's the secret to the life Jesus has given me. See, when we just quote it for whatever our personal preference is in life, we lose the significance of what Paul was talking about. And that's why today it's important for us to talk about this concept of, of application. So before we jump into Philippians 3, I want to just take a few moments and talk about just th- there's three steps to what's called basically Bible study or inductive Bible study. And these are steps that you can take. In fact, if you do these enough in the way that you approach the scriptures, it becomes kind of second nature and you take the time to do that. But there's three steps I just want to touch base and then we'll actually look at these when we actually look at Philippians chapter 3. The first one or the first step in reading, studying, or applying the Bible to our lives is we start with this thing called observation, which means when you open the Bible and you start reading a passage of Scripture, the first thing that you have to do is just observe what's there. In other words, what does it say? Not what does it say to you, but what does it say? And what is observation? Observation is simply reflecting back what you see or experience without commentary or opinion. We're so quick to jump to. I think this is what it means. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just observe what's there. So like, if you're standing up here where I am right now, I can observe and you can see, I can tell what everybody's wearing. I can tell if they're smiling or if they're frowning, if they really want to be here or they don't want to be here. I can observe all of that in the room right now. But I'm not going to make any commentary on that. I'm just, this is my observation from what I see. So when we come to a passage, before we jump to any understanding, we have to start with, what's there? What do I observe? What, what is playing to me on the page that I see before I jump to anything beyond that? The second thing is interpretation. So interpretation, this is where we think, oh, okay, this is when I figure out what it means for me. No, 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 that's skipping a, a very important step. So interpretation is this. What did it mean? Not what does it mean, what did it mean? What did it mean to the people who it was originally written to in the context that they were living in? When they first heard this or read this, what did they understand to be true? That's interpretation. So you're understanding something. And that is so important because normally the way that we approach the scriptures is we ignore all of the history, we ignore all of the background, we ignore all of the context, what's there, and we just say, what does it mean to me? Which really is the question at the last part of the process. If we ask that too soon, we won't really know what it means to us because we didn't know what it meant to them. And that's so important. But how many times do you pick up the Bible and you open somewhere in the middle and you just start reading and think, oh, I can understand this. That's the equivalent, like if, if you picked up a letter that I wrote to my wife, Kim, and say there's four paragraphs, and you jump in in paragraph three, and you start reading, and you're like, I know what this letter's about. How in the world would you know what the letter's about when you don't even really know who it was written to if, or, originally? And when you jump into paragraph three, there may be references to paragraph one and two that you have no context for, but you think, I got it because I only read paragraph three. We wouldn't do that. We don't look at a letter that way, do we? But many times we look at the Bible that way. Oh, I can just jump in there wherever and I can fully understand what's going on. That's why it requires digging. And then there's the the third step, and this is what we'll get to today. This is eventually we will land the plane, and that is application. And that's where we ask the question, what does it mean today? I've observed what's there. I've answered the question, what did it mean to them and all the history and language and background, and now I can take the step of, okay, now what does that mean for my life? What does that look like applied in my life? And that's important because one of the things that is, the things that is true about Scripture is there, there is not different meanings throughout time for Scripture. There's one meaning with many applications. Put it this way. 
A passage can never mean what it never meant. God doesn't change his mind somehow through thousands of years. and Like, yeah, you know what? Originally when Paul wrote that, it meant this. But I think I'm going to change the meaning. No, the meaning stays the same. The application is going to change because time changes and people change and culture changes. But we have to always make sure that we understand that. So with that quick snapshot, what I'm going to do, in fact, ushers, you can go ahead and start passing it out. Instead of taking the next three or four hours and going through volumes and volumes of information, what the ushers are handing out to you right now is basically taking these three steps, observation, interpretation, and application from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, which I'll read in a moment, and it's answering those questions. I'm not going to go through all this. That's why I'm giving this to you. This is actually your, this is a peek into my notes. This is what I'll do um, sometimes when I'm devotional, more and more I'll do it devotionally, but I'll definitely do this kinds of th- kind of thing when I'm preparing for Sunday morning. It's kind of getting the background of what's there. And I wanted to give this to you so that I don't have to spend all my time doing this, so you can reference it later. I'll read a reference a few things on there. But I want us to understand this is the process. And so before you, you think, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Pastor John thinks I have to be a Bible scholar. I need to go figure out how to speak Hebrew and know Greek and know Aramaic. and, and know all. No, I'm not saying that. What you see in front of you actually is accessible in a really simple study Bible. Somebody's already done this for you. In fact, if you, we always, if you have a study Bible, what do you usually do? You skip over the introduction, you get right to the meat of it, right? What is just, this is the word of God right here. I don't want to hear anybody else's information. You know what would really help you if you're reading through a book of the Bible? Read the introduction that someone's taken time to do, because you know what they'll do? They'll tell you who wrote it, when it was written, who it was written to, the circumstances around it, culture, what was going on, all the things that you need. They give you a framework by which you enter into that book, and then you go, oh, that's why Paul said this there. He's dealing with this issue. And sometimes we miss that, but a basic study Bible will give you all of that. They've done, you don't have to be a, a Bible scholar or go to seminary to learn this. So let me, let's jump in in Philippians chapter 3, and let me explain some context, and then I'm going to read the passage to you. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to kind of give you the overview of what, what's going on, then I'll read the passage. So we know that Paul, I mentioned this earlier, what we, from what we can understand, he's incarcerated when he's writing this book which is really interesting because if you read the whole book of Philippians, you realize that one of the themes that runs throughout it is joy, which is crazy. How's a guy in prison write about joy? It's Jesus, that's how he does it. But when you, you think of the context he's writing from, so he's writing, he's incarcerated. Why? Because Paul's a bad guy and he broke the law. No, Paul's a good guy and he broke the law. He was following Jesus. He was preaching the gospel. He was seeing people healed. And obviously that's a threat to the religious establishment and a threat to the government at the time. So he gets thrown into jail. He's incarcerated. He could have been under house arrest or in a prison cell. We don't know. We just know that he's incarcerated. So he's writing from that. He's writing to a group of people that he knows really well because he was there at the start. He was there when literally he came into Philippi and he ends up going down to the, by the river where they had this place of prayer and he finds a bunch of women praying together and that's like the, the launch team for the plant of the church at Philippi. That's where he started it. So he's very invested. And then as, as he's in ministry, there are times when he actually put out or maybe even didn't but was in a relationship that said, listen, I have need as I'm ministering the gospel, as I'm serving God's mission and, and no multiple times the church at Philippi sent him a gift and this actually the book of Philippians is actually a response to one of those gifts so this is the context that he's writing so he's writing to a group of people that he loves dearly he understands their context because he was in Philippi he knows what they're walking through and so with all of that this is this is what's interesting this is a very intimate letter he's writing to a group of people that he loves deeply and he knows well so with that, with that context, I want you to go ahead. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to read the first 17 verses here of this chapter so we can kind of take a look at it. So keep that as your frame of reference as Paul now starts to share something very deep inside of him about what it means for him to follow Jesus. So he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it, and it is safe for you. Verse 2, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who manipulate the flesh. Or, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him, verse 10, and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means I poss- possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Then verse 12, not that I have already att- obtained all this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it, or I uh, consider Excuse me, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but what one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything, uh, if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. And then finally, verse 17. Brothers, join in, 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 in excuse me, And imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. That's a lot. You're thinking, we're going to cover all of that? Oh, man, I'm hungry already. I need to get lunch, right? No, we're we're not going to get in every detail. We're going to, again, we're we're lowering. We're going to come down from 40,000 to about 30,000. Then we're going to get closer and closer. So think about, so Paul's writing to a group of people he loves dearly. He knows really well. He knows their context. He understands what's going on. This is what he conveys to them. So when you look at this, in fact, you can look on your notes right there that we handed out. So when we look at that, I'm not going to go through all the observation, but just look at the summary portion. What can we summarize from what we just heard? What does it say? What's there? What's obvious to us? That's this, from the context. Paul, a Jew, has become an apostle of Jesus, is writing from prison to the church he started in Philippi to express his heart and gratitude for their generosity and partnership in his ministry. He reveals his deepest desires to them about his relationship with Christ. He highlights the accomplishments of his past to demonstrate their worthlessness compared to knowing Christ in all facets of who he is. That's just what's there. That's just by observation. So we look at that and we see that's because we understand the context. We see what he said. So that's what's just a reflection back of what's there. Now, with that understanding, we think, okay, now wait a second. Now, what does Paul mean? What is he trying to communicate? What is he trying to say? So we move to the next step, which is, what did it mean to them? So this is important. So when Paul's writing this, again, some more context. This is basically in a study Bible. Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, which is a Roman colony. It's a Roman area. It's controlled by Rome. And he's writing to a group of Christians who are counter to the culture they live in, and the government opposes everything about them. So they're living in a hostile environment. They're living in a place where there's persecution, there's pressure, there is this overbearing, controlling government over them. And so Paul's writing this to this group of people. So this helps us to understand what he would be meaning to them about in the midst of your pressure, your persecution, the suffering that you're experiencing, here's what's most important. So here's the summary. As Paul was in prison and the church at Philippi lived under Roman rule, he wrote to challenge and encourage them to strain and press on to know Christ more as he was doing in prison. He knows his sufferings. He knows their suffering. He states no religious or earthly uh, accomplishment is even close to the joy and fulfillment of knowing Jesus. The most important thing in the midst of difficulty and pressure is for the Philippians to know Jesus more by sharing in the sufferings of Jesus and becoming like him in his death so that in the end they will experience resurrection from the dead. So that's, that's what Paul's meaning to them. That's what he's communicating to them. He says, I know where you're living. I know what it's about. I know what you're under, you, the pressure you're under. I know the persecution. I know the suffering. But listen, in all of that, you know what's most important? It's Jesus is knowing him more, is leaning into that, is pressing into that. That's what he's saying to them. So if we understand that, then now we back up, and now we're actually down probably close to like 10,000 feet. What does that start to mean to us? What does that mean to us today? This is important for us to to allow this to be unpacked. So in in your notes, you see this. So for me, I will always personally, even when I preach or in my devotional life, I'm going to ask the question, before I ever ask for a church, I'm asking, what does that mean for me? How are you, how is that, God, what are you, how, what did you write for me that I need to understand in this context? So uh, this is what I wrote down for me. 
My focus in 2016 when I face pressure, struggle, even lack of growth or at all times is to know Jesus more. It's not to be cliche, but that's the answer. By knowing the power of the resurrection, sharing in the sufferings of Jesus, and becoming like him in his death, so that in the end I will experience resurrection from the dead. So no religious or earthly accomplishment has value compared to the value of knowing Jesus fully. So for me, I can take from what they learn and I can learn for myself. In the midst of my life in 2016, when I think that there's an easy way out, I think that there's another option, I think there's something that can change my circumstances or make my life better, I come back to what Paul said 2,000 years ago, and he says, to know Christ. That's it. Now, why is this so important today? Well, it's really important for us as a church, not only Antioch, but the church in general, for believers today. This is really important. Why? Because you and I live in a context right now where we've spent the last year of our life hyper-focusing on the government. Who's going to be in office? Who's going to win the election? How we don't like the current administration? Some of you are dancing and, and excited because Trump won, and others are, are upset because Hillary lost, or vice versa, or whatever it is. And we've been hyper-focused thinking, oh, if we have the right person in power and the right administration, then all of our problems will be solved. They lived with an oppressive government 2,000 years ago. And if anybody had the right to complain about the government, it was the church at Philippi. Talk about an unjust government. The gov Roman government was completely unjust. We think our government's bad. Our government's great compared to what they had. But Paul says to them in the middle of it, listen, the answer is not the government. The answer is not what you're looking at. The, the answer is not the oppression that's over you, but know Jesus. So 2,000 years later, when we go through an election and we're looking again at the government, Paul reminds us, hey, it's not about who's in the White House. It's not about what party they're a part of. It's about knowing Jesus. That's the most important thing. So it applies to us. That's what's written there for the church. And the, even then they ask the question, how does this apply to world cultures around us? What, what, what is that? That means that if it was important for them 2,000 years ago to know Jesus, and it's important for us today to know Jesus, that's what it's important for the rest of the world to do. Know Jesus. So when you look at what, what's on the notes there, that's something that you can utilize, and you can take those questions, and you can apply that to any passage. And again, with a basic study Bible, you can come up with these conclusions. You don't need Pastor John to tell you that. In other words, you don't need to, to eat from the fish that I feed you. You can go fish for yourself. That's, the, that's the, the joy of coming to the scriptures. So now with that being said, now we're gonna land the plane. So now if you wanna know, I'm switching from teaching to preaching. So here we go. Because there comes out of a passage, when we do on a Sunday morning and what you'll do devotionally in, in reading and studying the scripture, is eventually you have to ask the hard questions about your life. Because one thing always happens when you really read and study the scriptures, the scriptures will read you. Because the Holy Spirit will read your heart and begin to convict you and to bring things out of your life that you didn't know were there or the things that need to be there. So the first question, I'm going to walk through four application questions that when we come to this passage we have to answer for ourselves. The first one is this. Is my knowledge of Jesus, the way that I know him, the way I relate to him, based on my past accomplishments? Now hear me, if you go back, we, we were to read the first few, few verses, Paul is giving a list, a ridiculous list of his past accomplishments. So again, because we are removed by 2,000 years and we're removed by culture, what Paul is listing there, any Jew would say, man, Paul is amazing. I mean, there's Jesus and then there's Paul. Maybe, you know, maybe God and Paul are like really close because they would look at that list and they go, wow, Hebrew of Hebrews, he's circumcised on the eighth day like a good Hebrew boy was supposed to be. But as far as like understanding and living out the law, he's blameless. As far as achieving the ultimate goal of Judaism, he's a Pharisee. And even when Jesus comes along and the church happens, he even in that reaches the highest level where he becomes what zealous and he becomes a persecutor of the church. At every level, Paul has the best resume of anyone. And if anyone has the right to say, I got this thing covered, I understand the way God works, it's Paul. He has, he has the resume to prove it. But what he's saying is none of that matters. In fact, we're, we won't get that honest, but if you look at the word rubbish, that's the equivalent to a swear word that Paul was using about his past. He's saying that's what it equates to. It's worthlessness. It's, it's, it's the value of something that you throw in the trash to get rid of forever. It doesn't mean anything. And what Paul's saying is, listen, everything that I've accomplished doesn't, doesn't make me know Jesus more. I can't, I can't look back to that. I can't look back to my past and rely on that. Why is that important for us? Because something happens. 
It happens to all of us. If you are a follower of Jesus, there comes a place in your journey with Jesus where you start to, you don't say it, but you start to think, I think I got this thing down. I think I got this Christian thing down. I, I know how to do devotions. I know how to go to church. I'm a good person. I tithe, you know, 11% of my income, so I'm a little bit better than everybody else. And that we get the Christian routine down. And we think, I, I really, I think I got a handle on who God is, and I just got to kind of live this, this kind of good, honest, mediocre life until Jesus comes back, and then I'm all good. What are you relying on? You're relying on the past that you've had, the, the kind of the, the track record you've laid down. And for knowledge of Jesus and who he is in your life today, that doesn't qualify. It doesn't work. But sometimes we think, we've arrived. I remember the first moment in my life where I really like, came to one of those times where I, I thought that. I was 27 years old. I can still, I can tell you the exact chair I was sitting in and when it happened, I was sitting in, at, at the Habit in Ventura with Dennis Easter, who was my boss at the time. And so I had been out of Bible college. I had been in two years of full-time ministry. And Dennis and I were talking about future. He was the pastor of the church that I was on staff with. And so we were talking about what the future looked like for him, what it looked like for me. And so he, he gave me this, he asked me this question. He said, if I were to like take another assignment and move, go somewhere else, or I was to retire or whatever, he goes, would you be ready to take the church? And I started thinking, I'm like, yes, I would. Because this is exactly what happened in my mind. I'm like, okay, four years, of, well, excuse me, it was five years of Bible college. I got married somewhere in there, so it took me five. I was on the slower track. I knew Hebrew and Greek, and I'd studied all the things that I'm supposed to study. I had two years of ministry experience. I was raised in a Christian household. I mean, I had it all, and I even went to every conference and read all the books on church planting and how to pastor a church. So I'm thinking, all of this is coming to mind. I'm like, I'm ready. I've arrived. I didn't say that to Dennis, but in my mind, I'm thinking, and honestly, in my mind, I'm being honest with you. Dennis knows this. I'm really honest with Dennis later on. I thought, I could do it better than you. Stupid, stupid <laughs> comment. And I remember that because I had gone through my history and thought, yeah, I know Jesus. I know his church. I know the Bible. I know all these things. Therefore, I can do this. Funny thing is, three years later, that church sent Kim and I out to plant a church, and then I really realized something. I knew nothing and had to learn the hard way of what Jesus was really trying to teach me. Where is it in your journey with Jesus that you've come to that moment? See, because what you know what that leads to, eventually leads to? It leads to apathy and a boring faith that we tolerate and we just do our time till Jesus comes back. When you read the book of Acts, you never saw anyone doing time till Jesus comes back. Their life was full of excitement and danger and pain and suffering and all kinds of things. Second question to apply to our lives. Am I resting on my past instead of forgetting straining and pressing toward knowing Jesus. What do I mean by resting? So, Paul has had tons of experience when he's writing this. He's been out preaching the gospel. He's seen miracles happen. He's had an encounter with Jesus. He's planted churches. I mean, he has done more before he writes this than most people will do in their lifetime in following Jesus. But even in the middle of that, what does he say? He said, I haven't obtained all this. I haven't obtained the full knowledge of Jesus yet but I know he's gotten a hold of me, and so because I haven't gotten all this, even though, again, he's got, the, he's got the resume, he's got the experience in the church, he's got all of that, he's saying, listen, I haven't gotten there yet, so what am I doing? I'm pressing, I'm straining, I'm striving, I'm forgetting what happened in the past, and I'm actually straining for what's in the future because I know what God has for me because there's more. Why is that important for us? Because there's something in our minds that equates retirement from work with retirement from what Jesus is doing in our lives. Now, I'm not saying this is true of everyone, but there's something that's crept into our culture. When you read through the Bible, you can come up with a good theology on retirement from work. You might. I don't know if you can really find it, but I think you probably could. One thing you'll never find in the Bible is retirement from Jesus. It's not there. But sometimes, and what I mean, it doesn't mean that you check out on Jesus, but it's like I've seen this happen in life, and it, it can happen to someone in their 50s, it can happen to someone in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, is that you've worked hard your whole life, and you finally get to retirement, and retirement in your mind means no longer do I work, but I don't have to worry about serving in the church, I don't have to worry about being a part of anything that the church is doing, I don't really have to lean in like I used to in following Jesus because you really aren't in it over your head anymore because now you can kind of coast because you've worked really hard your whole life, and because of that, what happens is that we not only, we intentionally retire from work, but unintentionally retire from Jesus. 
And I've seen the opposite where I've watched people retire at 55 and they got a good 30 years left because they're really healthy and they realize I've got a whole new life. One of those guys is Bob Amstutz who serves with Connect2 in Haiti who retired from the sheriff's department and now he's able-bodied and now he's got his, literally it feels like his whole life ahead of him. He's retired in body but he's not retired in spirit. And here's the reality when we follow Jesus. And it's not, I don't just say this because I'm a pastor. Retirement happens when you die. And that's not just following Jesus, that's serving Jesus' purpose. And that's why sometimes it's crazy. I mean, we, we got people in our church that have so much experience in following Jesus and knowing the Lord, and we have a number of them who are older who are serving with their kids. But we have some that just, you know what, I'm retired. I like to get up late. Sometimes I don't get up in time for church. I don't want to serve the kids. I don't want to work with young people. I don't want to go to Haiti. I don't want to be in a community group. I did all that. I've heard that from people. I'm like, oh, man. Jesus, shoot me now, please. I don't want to be that person. No offense if that was you or it is you, okay? <laughs> because that means that I, what you're saying is I've done it all and there's no more to be done. There's no more to learn. There's no more stretching. There's no more straining. There's no pressing on why. Because I did all that and now I just get to coast until Jesus comes back. There's no coasting with Jesus because coasting me- makes you fall asleep and you get bored in your faith because you're not pressing in on what Jesus is doing. And then there's a third question. I know these are not easy, but this is what comes out of the application process. We are down on the ground level. Third one, how well do I actually know Jesus? Is there power, suffering, and sacrifice in my journey with and toward him? What did Paul say? I want to know him, and then he references what? Fellowship of his sufferings. He talks about power of the resurrection. So the question out of that is, is there power? If I'm supposed to somehow participate in the sufferings of Jesus, in the death of Jesus, in the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus means that there's some kind of dynamic of power in my life that I should be experiencing. Do I know Jesus well enough to see that kind of power happen in my life? Now that was one we strive for and that's one we hope for, but the other ones we don't like to talk about because he says what? The fellowship of his sufferings. You mean actually learning to suffer as Jesus suffered? How did Jesus suffer? Jesus was rejected. Jesus was abused. Jesus was marginalized. Jesus was taken to the cross. He suffered incredible physical uh, abuse uh, on his way to the cross and on the cross. He suffered his his whole whole existence. He was born in a manger, which we were always born in a manger. He was born in in a trough that was used to feed cattle in what we understand probably wasn't a nice little warm in like we think it was. It was probably an outside place that stunk like crap. Seriously, that's the way he enters into the world, and it doesn't get better for Jesus. He walks this life of suffering, and Paul says, for me to know Jesus means I have to choose the same road that Jesus did. That's why John says in in 1 John chapter 2, if we know him, we will what? Walk or live as Jesus lived. Now, if we don't want to know Jesus, we can say, I'm done with suffering. I'm good. I'm good. I got enough. I'm just going to hang on until Jesus turns. But if we want to know Christ, then we have to walk as he walked. There's something in suffering that changes our understanding of who Jesus is. And I think all of us would say this is true. If you go back to a moment in your life where you knew there was accelerated growth or a deeper understanding of God's love or something profound that happened in your life, it didn't come in the most comfortable season of your life. It didn't. It came in the most trying season of your life. It came in the most painful season of your life. Why? Because something, there's something about our humanity that requires pain and suffering for us to truly be desperate for God to do something. And that's why the more comfortable we become, the more sometimes disconnected we become with what God is doing. That's why, where is the church growing the fastest in the world? Where there's the most persecution. Middle East right now, underground, it's growing. China is exploding. What, those are places where it's illegal to be a Christian, right? But what does that mean? There's something that happens. Think about your own experience. Now, I, I have met a lot of people who have suffered a lot more in their lives than I have suffered in mine, but I've had some seasons in my life where you kind of get to that point where you're like, God, really? You're supposed to be the God who heals. You're supposed to be the God who answers prayer. You're supposed to be the God that is all-powerful, and so why can't you take this out of my life? Why can't you make me whole? Why can't you heal me? Anybody ever prayed that prayer or got frustrated with God? That's part of the suffering, but I'll know in those seasons of my life, I lean in harder and harder and harder to Jesus. When we moved to Oregon, one of the things that really was kind of an eye-opener to me, we should have figured it out with as much as it rains up there, 
But I've always struggled throughout my life with severe allergies. And, and this last decade has been the best kind of season of my life as far as allergies because we live in a dust bowl called Simi Valley and there's hardly any rain. But when we moved to Oregon, we moved to just, just south of Portland, which is at the northern end of the Willamette Valley, which the Willamette Valley has some of the highest pollen count in the world. It's like the worst place on earth you can go if you have severe allergies. So God, where does God call us? The Willamette Valley. So we get there, and I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the most incredible things is God was already doing a profound work in our city and in the church there. So it's like literally, it's like God was driving this train, and God said to the Amstead family, just hop on board because I'm driving and we're going. So when we get there, I mean, amazing things are already happening. It, it, it's, it's, it's this incredible thing of what's happening in the city, what's happening in people's lives, and people being transformed. And so ministry is like unbelievable. It's like, wow, we just woke up to reality that God still is working in people's lives because we had come out of a very difficult context in Ventura, and so we were wondering, God, are you real? Does the church still grow? And we jump into this thing, and it's just going great. But for the first year we were there, maybe a little bit longer, I did not go a day without having hives on my body. I started breaking out within the first probably two months of being in that area. And it was severe. I had gone through two rounds of this in my life before, but this one was different. Every single day, I had hives. I'd have them on my extremities. Sometimes it would get me in the face, and so I would swell up. You know, remember, you know, Will Smith and, and Hitch? Remember that? That was me, and Kim would look at me and be like, ah, oh, who are you? I'm your, I'm your husband, remember me? And it was, that's, that was my reality every single day for like a year. And throughout that year, what am I doing? I'm praying. I'm, I'm asking the elders. I'm anointing with oil. Pray for me. I'm, I'm, I'm like... I'm crying out to God. I'm frustrated. It's like, and then, you know, you're supposed to lead people in faith and inside you're like, God, really? You know, and then you, anybody pray this prayer? God, if you just heal me, I'll be a testimony for you. Anybody pray that prayer? That one didn't even work. Still got hives. There were days when I had to get up and preach publicly and my face was swollen. I'm like, this is so embarrassing. And Jesus said, remember, it's not about you. I'm like, yeah, but it is, Right? <laughs> It's embarrassing. And I remember for a year, I just pressed in, pressed in, pressed in, pressed in. It's like, God, why aren't you doing this? I got closer to Jesus in that year than I had in a long time because I was desperate. He never healed me of that. I had to go through another extensive round of tests and a treatment and finally got on top. And I still, to this day, have to be on antihistamines to keep things controlled. So it's like, okay, God. But I'll know one thing's for sure. I'm closer to Jesus today because I had hives than if I would have had it easy. And I think all of us have those stories and some much more profound than having allergies. But God works in that way. And that's why for you and I to ask the question, is there power, is there suffering, is there sacrifice in my life means if those things are not there, then guess what? There's something more that I haven't understood about Jesus yet because I've walked through those times. And then the final question is this. This is one we have to ask every day and every week. How am I going to live my life differently today or this week because of what I know? This is one of the things just comes with a warning. When you choose to engage the scriptures in an honest way to get to the point of application in your life, you will now know. You will have knowledge that you didn't have before, and with knowledge comes responsibility. Now I know. Now I know what Paul was saying. Now I know what he was talking about. Now I know what it means for me. Now what do I do about that? How do I live that out? And so with this passage, do I, I ask myself the question, am I living off of borrowed, recycled, or current knowledge of God? Am I living off of something I have in the past or am I living off somebody else's experience about what they said about Jesus or am I living in this reality that I'm leaning into what Jesus is trying to teach me about who he is through my life so that I'm like Paul that, yeah, I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet. I know a lot about Jesus, but I don't know everything about Jesus, which by the way, in this life you won't because he's God and you can't, but it can't, shouldn't stop us from pursuing knowledge of him, understanding him. Why is this important? Because this is the truth of following Jesus. There is always more to know about him and there is always more to know in relationship with him, always. Until the day you die, there will be more to know about Jesus. There will be a deeper walk that he's calling you to. But when we plateau and we make statements about how I think I've got God handled, I think I've designed the perfect box for him that he can't get out of and I can contain him, he will destroy that box. See, as human beings, we always want to do that. We always want to kind of, I need to get a grasp on this. I need to put it in a way that I can understand it so I can contain it, control it. I can feel safe and comfortable. And then something happens, you're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. That's Jesus. You can't contain him. Let me read a couple of quotes. You can find a million of these on the internet. But this is, this is, this is our human condition. We make statements about things that we don't know about thinking that we know everything. 
So this statement was made by Western Union in 1876 in an internal memo. This is what was said. Remember Western Union, which is like, you know, the mode of communication back in the 1800s? says, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Whoops. Anybody got one of these? Still around. How about this one? IBM, Chairman, 1943. I think there's a market for maybe five computers. <laughs> IBM. It's kind of struggling, haven't they been? Just a little bit. If you have a phone, what is this? This is a phone and a computer all in one. I think that, I don't know what the last tally was, but I know Apple sold more than a billion of these. That's not including like Samsung and LG and all the other phones. There's, oh, I bet you, there's probably as many cell phones on the planet as there are people today. Over seven billion cell phones. But this has no value to us, does it? <laughs> Give me a break. Some of us can't live without it, right? This has changed our lives. But people couldn't see that, so they thought, we've kind of reached the ceiling on this thing called the telephone or on the computer, only to find out that the ceiling was limitless. How many times with Jesus do you reach this place of, oh, yeah, I think I got this thing down, but only to realize there's more that Jesus wants for you. Let me close with this, and then the worship team will come up for one last song. In fact, worship team, you can come and join me. As I was thinking th about this message and thinking about knowing Jesus, th this is just the way my mind works, okay? I'm not a romantic, but the movie You've Got Mail came to mind, okay? Anybody seen that movie? Okay, it's, you know, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. and So not to spoil it if you're going to see it, because I think it's like 20 years old now. So I'm going to spoil it anyway. The whole thing is based on this couple ends up getting connected in an online relationship through email, okay? And this was back when, remember that thing called AOL? In American Online, you know, you got mail. So they get in this relationship and they're emailing back and forth only to discover that they actually live in the same area and are in the similar business and he discovers first that he knows who she is, but she doesn't know who he is. And they're friends. Actually, they're enemies because he is a corporation that is shutting down her small bookstore and he's about big money and she's about small market and relationships. And so like they're the polar opposite. But he discovers early on that he knows who she is through the emails, but she has no idea. So their relationships gets built on this, this reality that he knows who she is. And he's revealing, he, she's getting to know him, but she doesn't know really who he is. And so the, the whole journey is really interesting because you could tell he's falling in love with her and she's kind of, even though originally he's like an enemy to her, there's this real, weird dynamic and she thinks she's engaging this guy face to face, but she's having another relationship with a guy on the internet. She doesn't know it's the same guy. So they're building this relationship throughout the movie, and at the very end of the movie, through email, he says to her, Let's, we should meet face to face. And so they set up this meeting in a park. And so he says that I'll be there, and I'll be there with my dog, so you know, you know it's going to be me. And so they had to exchange pictures, but he knows her. And so, so they spent all this time getting to know each other, and then finally, in this park, she comes up over this, she's actually standing in this garden, he comes up over this hill, and she sees him, and they hug and, you know, they kiss and all that stuff, you know, and the music plays and all that stuff. Okay, that's secondary. But what she says is really important. She says this. She says, I, I was hoping it was going to be you. See, this guy that she had gotten to know but didn't know for sure if it was the guy online, she, in her mind, she's saying, I was, I was hoping it's you. And when he came up over that horizon and it was him, she was filled with joy. And when I, I've watched that movie a couple times, probably a couple times too many to be honest. But her response should be is similar to what I think our response will be in eternity. See, if you spend your life knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus, every day of your life you know him more because he's pushing in on you and you're pressing forward and he's taking you through seasons of suffering and, and struggle as you try to live like him and be like him and, and understand that even to the point where Jesus gave his life and he was willing to die that he may ask you someday to give your life for him but you're doing that what you're doing in this life is you're getting to know him better and better and more and more and then someday with these cl this cloth clothing of humanity is stripped away and we are resurrected and we stand face to face the way he intended for us. We're going to look at him in his fullness and we're going to go, yes, it is you. 
It's the one that I've, been known, I've known my whole life, but now I know all of you. Now I know who you are. Now I see you in fullness the way you intended. And then, yes, you and I get to live happily ever after. But I want you to think about that because there's a lifetime ahead for most of us in this room. Not of doing time, not of waiting for Jesus to come back, not of living out our own agenda, but daily pressing in to know Jesus to know him more and more so that just like Paul, I haven't gotten all this, I haven't obtained it, but I press on to know him and everything about him and to be with him. And that means when we have a conversation two years from now, your, God doesn't change, but our knowledge of Jesus better change. That means we're progressing. We know more of who he is. And there's those markers in our life. We go, yeah, that man, that's when God blew my mind. That's when he blew the box apart. That's when I understood more about him through that difficult time or through that season. Because God wants us to know him more and more and more and more. Don't be stuck. Don't be plateaued. Don't get complacent. Don't be comfortable. But push in to Jesus. So would you close your eyes as we pray? And then we're going to sing one last song. The beauty of who Jesus is, and this is what we're going to talk about in the month of December, is his love was so deep and continues to be so profound for humanity that he became a human being, and we'll talk about what that meant for him. But he became a human being, and as we, we just briefly mentioned, he, he lived a difficult life because he knew what he came to do, which was to establish or to... to ring in, in a sense, the kingdom of God coming to humanity. God's power, his forgiveness, his healing, his restoration, his reconciliation back to God through Jesus. He came to do that, and he knew that that, that journey of suffering would take him to the ultimate point of suffering on the cross, which was to take our place, to pay for our sin and our brokenness and our failure, so that we could be the righteousness that he had before God. And in that, we could have a relationship with God again. Jesus did that because of his deep love for us and then says to us today, I want to know you more. I want you to know me more. I want you to experience more of what it means to truly live in a relationship with me. And so every single day of your life, as we sang earlier, Above, below, front, behind. Christ be all around me. Christ be in me. Christ work through my circumstances. God, through Jesus, be present in the monotony of my life. In the low moments, in the high moments. Jesus, would you be present? Would you be teaching me and stretching me and causing me to strain to know you more and more and more? God wants that to be each one of our desires. In fact, just even with your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you don't even know him. You hear me talking about knowing Jesus, and you're like, I don't get that. I have a concept of God, but I don't know him like, like a friend. And if that's you, he gives you an invitation to believe in him, to trust in him for the things that will keep you away from God, the things that will disqualify you from being in God's family, the things that will destroy you and lead you away from God. Jesus has given his life to pay for, to wash those things away so that he can invite you to be part of his family, to actually know him, to know God. And if that's your desire today, you can do that. And the way you do it, believe it or not, by his spirit, he's present in this room today. In fact, he's probably been working on you and you don't even know it, but maybe you're acknowledging that he, you felt something about God, but you couldn't put a finger on it. That's Jesus reaching out to you, telling you to say, it's time. It's time for me to surrender my life, to no longer live as me being God, but let God be God through Jesus in my life. If that's you, then you begin to talk, begin to pray, which is just talking to God. Jesus, I, I want to surrender my life to you. I want to give my life to you. I want to know what it is to know you every day of my life. So Lord Jesus, I pray for us today as we just conclude in a few moments but are reminded of the fact that you are a God who is present, who wants to be known more and more each day. So Lord, challenge us this week. Draw us closer as we engage the scriptures. Speak to us so that ultimately when we stand before you someday, we look at you. We don't look at you as a stranger. You don't look at us as a stranger, but we look at each other as best friends connected for eternity. We thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in our lives today. In your name.